Good morning. It's uh, such an honor to have been invited here, and I'm pleased to represent Walla Walla. Uh, we are the, could you back up one? I think it skipped one. We're the Children's Resilience Initiative. Um, I am one of the community networks that has been under Laura Porter's guidance until um, a very bad mistake happened at the legislative level with their thinking, and they defunded um, probably the best thing that was going on in Washington State for almost 20 years, so we're still trying to figure that one out. But um, the networks themselves retain their authority, and um, so we're still trying to do our work. But I did want to acknowledge Laura Porter, and then I also want to blame this whole thing on, on Rob. And uh, because if Rob had not challenged the networks in the fall of 2007 at a conference we all attended in a tiny community, and Washington, I probably wouldn't have come home all fired up because he challenged us to go home to our communities because he, and I think the, the uh, demise of the Family Policy Council was his type of prediction is that uh, wonderful things don't happen at the state level or at the national level, that it has to bubble up from communities. And uh, it really kind of angered me that day because he was saying stuff that I just didn't feel made sense because we know so much about all of this, why do we have to repeat this over and over? And um, because I have a fisheries management background, and actually my 20 years with the federal system was specializing in fish stress, and whether we really needed to take out every single dam on the Columbian Snake River system over fish stress. So when I, when I switched gears and came into this world of children's stress, and, and here he's saying, go home and recreate the wheel. I thought, man, that's a broken system, buddy. But, you know, I'm, I was also raised in a military family, and my dad was also a medical doctor, so I'm really good at taking orders, and, and, and I'm, a, I'm a do it now. And, and so I thought, okay, Rob, I'm gonna prove you that we can do this in Walla Walla. Okay, so you're looking at a couple quick snapshots, snapshots of our beautiful valley. We're a city of 32,000 individuals in a, a rather remote corner of southeast Washington. When Rob showed his um, Fantasia, I, I was mad at myself for not showing our Looney Tunes because we usually open with the three world famous Looney Tunes of Walla Walla, Washington. My favorite is the Wishy Washy Washing Machine Company of Walla Walla, Washington. And everybody always laughs and then we all feel good about where the hell is Walla Walla? So we're in the southeast corner of Washington State. It's a beautiful area, as you can see. Uh, primarily agriculture until the wine um, business found us, and now we've been discovered. So don't move to Walla Walla. We're not taking any new people, and certainly not if you're from California. So, sorry. Um, we're a county of 60,000. As I told you, 32 is right in the city of Walla Walla. There's 10,000 right next door in a small community, bedroom community called College Place. So really, we have the meat of our whole county in close proximity, and it doesn't take you more than five minutes to get anywhere in Walla Walla. And that's one of the big jokes is you can't hide from Terry because um, I know where you live, and you're only five minutes away. And so I've often credited my geographic setting, perhaps with some of our success, that plus the longevity of me being in this position. People know me and they know it's the do it now. And my favorite um, compliment ever paid to me, I think was Mike Bates is my, uh, he's the court, juvenile court director. And when I asked him to join the Children's Resilience Initiative, I didn't think he'd say yes right away. And he said, all right, all right, yes. And I said, why are you saying yes on my first visit? And he said, yeah, Barella, because I know if I don't say yes, you won't leave me alone. <laughs> and so I've been told I'm persistent, but that's why I like do it now. Okay, so uh, when Rob challenged us to go home, we thought, all right, well, I said, first of all, I need somebody to help me with this. And so I convinced a colleague who was brand new to Walla Walla from the Seattle side, he has a mental health background. I thought that would really balance my fisheries because who the hell, what, what's a fisheries biologist doing in this anyway? So I can always use Mark's credentials when mine fail me. But I said the one thing we have to do is we have to make this about resilience. I don't want it to be about ACEs because people feel that's a dead end. And so we always start in all of our presentations talking about the power of resilience and the power of a resilient community. It's not just building individual resilience. And a lot of Laura's um, 
data that she started to show us yesterday is the power of resilience at the community level and how that can change communities. So that's a big theme that we talk about. And I didn't just start this cold. Um, I'd been doing this for 15, 16, I guess 16 years now. And for example, we just had our eighth biennial children's forum, and this is the data book we present. So for 16 years, we've tracked our data trends in our community, and we update it every, um, well, now we're going to update it every five years. This book we dedicated to ACEs and resilience in almost every domain of the Hawkins and Catalano model that we uh, employ the communities that care, talks about some aspect of ACEs and more importantly the aspect of resilience. So um, our feature is resilience, it's our middle name, we're not the children's ACE initiative. And we, we try to help parents in particular, but anybody that will um, have us come present to them, we're really about trying to help um, understand how that experience shapes the brain. You see the key learning points here, how that shapes who we become as adults. Um, and that this is not fate. I, I love how much we've heard that th these two days. This is about how we can help b build resilience into our lives and move forward with the hope and healing. And um, I can blame Rob for another thing. When we brought him to Walla Walla after his three and a half hour, is Rob in the room? I guess I really want to hit him hard. No, darn it, he left. He probably left because he knew I was going to do this. After his three and a half hour seminar, which a room of about this size and almost all professionals, but I had invited a woman um, who worked with my mom because we had mom in, in our home. She has dementia. And she went to that uh, session of of Rob's, and at the end, I, of, out of 165 professional people, and this woman had been in the system her whole life, and her children were in the system, I see her come up to the stage, and she takes the phone from Rob, and I'm, I'm just like, oh my God, what is Annette doing? She won't even look me in the eye. She barely talks to me, and she's been in my home for four years. What's she going to do? And she turns around, and you can see she's just been crying. I mean, she's got tears streaming out of her eyes, and she takes the microphone and she says, for the first time in my life, I understand I am not the bad parent I've been told I am. I am not the bad person. I have 10 aces. Now I understand why my life has been so hard. I don't have to hide in the shame and blame thinking that God was punishing me for who I am. And you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, it was out. I mean, it, it was amazing. And so I thought, oh my gosh, if, if Annette could have this transformative moment in this three and a half hours, how many Annettes are there just in Walla Walla? How many are there in the United States that could do what Annette's done? And, and she has made a, a huge change in her life as a result of this information. In fact, she co-presents with us. And the joke with Annette, she's done 36 co-presentations with us. We've done over 400. She absolutely gets a standing ovation every time. We've never gotten a standing ovation. <laughs> and so I always say to Annette, can you teach me how to get a standing ovation? <laughs> so what, what we do in our community, and, and um, those of you who have found our website called Resilience Trumps Ace is what we try to perhaps help others learn based on our experience in Walla Walla. Well, we, we started the initiative. Um, it's a broad-based team of community members. We spent seven months just talking to people, uh, the main leadership in Walla Walla, because we didn't want to just call this team together and then have everybody stare at each other. So we spent a long time doing the um, focus groups and, and getting people's understanding and their feedback and their red flags and what was going to bother them about trying to do this. And um, because many were already familiar with my work, they said, all right, Terry, we know you're a do it, so we'll come because we're not going to come if it's another meeting where we admire our problems. Um, I love, I'd never heard somebody say it that way, and I thought, wow, that's, that's another thing you ought to have is we don't admire our problems, we do it. So we, we got started with, with the two goals of raising awareness of ACEs, but primarily fostering resilience. And, and we knew that we were only the messenger, so it was all about embedding the principles into the um, practice and daily routine of our community. I think that's what you hear. You won't hear p-values from me either, but you'll hear, you'll hear change lives. And if you talk to anybody in Walla Walla, that's where I think you then get your p-values. Um, so we did that by creating a community conversant in ACEs and resilience. And I'd like to recognize the Gates Foundation because they did give us a three-year grant that funded our initial three years of this work. 
And so we did a lot of community education. You see the list here. But primarily I knew from working with Annette and other parents like Annette that we really needed concrete strategies because Annette said to me, Terry, you talk about resilience. I understand what the word is, but I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what it really means. And so that gave us um, the idea of creating a deck of cards. And if you've been on our website, you may have seen them. But using a lot of the resilience materials that I studied, we, we ended up with 42 concrete examples in this deck of cards, 42 ways to help a parent understand what the word resilience means because, of course, many of the parents we work with uh, didn't grow up in a resilient household. And these, this deck of cards has a handbook. Um, somebody has the handbook that I brought that we could demonstrate. And then recently the Exchange Club finally um, gave us a grant to go professional with our cards. So there's even a box now and there's a lid and we don't have to use rubber bands anymore. So those are the types of things that we've done. We, we also um, put together materials like um, at our early Head Start and our Head Start program, we did a resilience treasure hunt night where each kid got their very own handmade little uh, pirate-themed treasure map. And on the back, they had to find 10 resilience stations with their mom or dad or care provider. And they would practice 10 of those 42 strategies for that night and actually get practice on what it means to be empathic or to express feelings or to ask for help. And it was, um, we're going to have that uh, put together as, as another toolkit for, for folks. It's been very, very helpful. And really it's about shifting community thinking. It's moving from that concept of blame to the science that we now know. And it's helping people, like Annette said, um, to walk away from that shame and blame because it was not your fault. Again, the cosmic slide yesterday that Nancy showed, you know, who got to pick the family they were born into. So this, that's the trauma lens shift is um, what, instead of what's wrong with this child, what has this child been through? And the minute I say that, I also, oh, you missed everything, Rob. <laughs> Darn it. Um, the, the minute I say that, I also go immediately to the accountability because I agree with especially what um, Dr. Ginsburg was saying this morning. Hold them accountable, but do it from the compassion and empathic response, not from punishment, because we know punishment just does not work. And this is the slide that pretty much changed the alternative high school in town. We had Dr. John Medina come to town in addition to uh, Rob and also Dr. Folletti, but. Uh, Medina was the one that really helped our school district. In fact, one of our biggest accomplishments, and I wish we could put a p-value on that, was that we went to the school board and said, would you please close school for the day so every single staff person, including bus drivers and the superintendent, would come to John Medina's four-hour seminar. And we, of course, we knew they'd say no, but we at least wanted it on the record that we asked. And we were like dumbfounded that it was a unanimous seven vote yes to close school. That's never happened in the 29 years I've lived in Walla Walla, where they close school so that everybody, including the uh, maintenance people, the janitor, everybody came. And it was to hear that a stress brain just can't function um, under that toxic load. And so we just have to help them get out of the brain stem and up to the cognitive stem. And that's what changed the whole dynamics for our Lincoln Alternative High School, because they understood that and they put that into practice. So we've done a, a lot of work on um, resilience and trying to help parents. This one is for teachers, but we've, we've studied the different models. And we really think Dr. Grotberg did the best job of getting it down to parent language. We love the I have, I am, I can, because a parent and teachers, they just go right to that. And so we help them with this, what, what those really mean, the strategies there. We use the deck of cards. We, they get to play games and how they can build it in the uh, students or um, themselves. So that's been a real positive step for us. And really, it's about the language. When you learned your native language, you, you started with words, right, and vocabulary. What we know from Dr. Grothberg's work is we don't do that. We don't have the language. We don't have the vocabulary. Therefore, people don't know how to, to, to model it and certainly not how to promote it. Her international study suggested it's only promoted 38 percentile. No wonder our kids don't have those resilience strategies. Nobody's intentionally teaching them. And one of our biggest moments for me personally was when a young um, Hispanic dad of a five-year-old after playing with the deck of cards with us one night said, Terry, so much of this is common sense, but I didn't understand that I had to be intentional 
in teaching this to my child. I just thought it was there and it would come out when he needed it. And I love that um, intentionality concept there. And another great story on that um, promoting it is our alternative high school, the behavior classroom, you know, quote, behavior classroom where you really throw away the kids. Uh, uh, that teacher this entire school year, she has spent teaching the ACE study to her classroom of kids, um, the brain science behind it, um, journaling every day if they choose to, the resilience uh, information, and now they've created games, resilience games that they want to add to our toolbox for parents for fourth to seventh grade kids. They're going to demonstrate that May 30th, and they invited 15 caring adults to come critique the games. So pretty soon we're going to see the year's result oh, of, of that work. Um, so if you go to our website, uh, oh, this, this, okay. This changes parents' lives when they understand that the intentional misbehavior, uh, shaming for the lack of skills the child missed in that development period, criticizing blame and punishment does absolutely nothing but continue the cycle of frustration, revenge, anger. And this is one of the biggest slides in our toolbox. The rest you can find on our website. And I thought I was talking fast enough because on the East Coast you talk really fast. <laughs> and, and, and so I've always, you know, on the West Coast everybody says, Guy, why do you talk so fast? And I've always said, because I'm from the East Coast. I was born and raised in D.C. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. I'm a pediatrician and uh, the CEO of the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco. And I'd love to share a little bit about our experience with uh, screening for ACEs. And I'd like to be as concrete as possible. So um, when I finished my um, when I finished medical school uh, at UC Davis. I uh, was passionate about health disparities, and I wanted to learn how to heal communities. And so I went to and did my master's in public health at Harvard. And what I learned at Harvard is water is wet, which is if you are poor, if you are a person of color, if you're a recent immigrant, if you're a non-English speaker, if you live in the projects, uh, your health outcomes will be worse. And, uh, and it made me mad because I, uh, my family came to the United States when I was uh, four years old from Jamaica. Um, we were poor, I was black, we were recent immigrants, and I was like, I didn't need to go to Harvard to learn this. <laughs> um, and so uh, when I finished my residency and uh, started my uh, clinical practice, I founded a clinic called uh, the Baby Child Health Center for California Pacific Medical Center. And I started taking care of kids. And, um, and uh, you know, long story short, the families in the community were sending us all their kids and saying, Dr. Burke, can you please take care of our, for Bobby? He's in class. He's falling out. He's doing all this stuff. And, uh, and um, you know, he's got ADHD. Can you put him on some Ritalin? And um, obviously, for most of our kids, they didn't really have ADHD, right? And uh, when I got the history, when I did my job and did a thorough history and physical, most of them had um, uh, very high ACEs scores, and most of them were manifesting symptoms of toxic stress. And uh, I just want to talk about what our experience was in kind of doing um, the screening and how that came to be. And a lot of it was because I had no idea what I was doing, no idea what was possible, and no idea what was not possible. I want to talk about uh, one of the first things that we did um, was uh, we created a process called multidisciplinary rounds. When we started the clinic, it was myself, a nurse, and a medical assistant, and that was it. And uh, I was you know, out speaking about uh, health disparities, and I said, you know, we need a case manager. And someone in the room was from a foundation, and they said, we can help you get a case manager. So we got a case manager. And someone else said, oh, we can help you get a psychologist. Uh, and, we, and we got a psychologist. And so it was, you know, us uh, working together. I was the only doctor. We were, I was seeing all the patients. And the way that our multidisciplinary round started, not because it was any kind of crazy best practice, but because probably about once a week, I would walk into my psychologist's office 
And I would sit down in a chair and I would cry. And I would hear the stories of all of our kids and um, the moms and, uh, and it would just break my heart and I couldn't deal with it. And our psychologist said to me, you need a process. <laughs> like, it's kind of like a, uh, what, what Dr. Ginsburg mentioned earlier, you, you need to have a script. And so uh, we began meeting once a week. And I would say, you know, I've got this kid. Uh, he re recently witnessed uh, someone running through the house shooting after his parents. And he is now having bedwetting. He's having uh, developmental regression. He's, having, uh, he's struggling in school. And my case manager said, OK, cool. I'll do a home visit. I'll take care of this. My psychologist would say, OK, I, I, I'm going to do, uh, you know, we can start uh, therapy. Or uh, you know, if we didn't have capacity, or if they needed something specific, or whatever, we'll refer them out, and I'll make sure that happens. And as a result of that, I was able to begin doing. Um, uh, when I learned about the ACE, ACE screening, I was able to begin doing universal screening, and the reason was because we had a means of disposition. I would not have been able to do it um, otherwise. That is. Not my slide. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Slide. What the heck is going on? May, may, can we back up? Uh, back up for a second. No. Okay. Go forward. That's weird. Um, so, anyways, um, we um, so we started. Uh, so when I learned about um, the ACEs study, I uh, for for me, it, that took water is wet to. Water is made out of dihydrogen monoxide, and here are the components, and here are the properties, and this is, this is, this is why water is wet. And it was, for, as a clinician, uh, something really powerful for me because it helped me figure out what to do. And one of the first things that we did was we um, received a small amount of funding to be able to do a retrospective chart review to see how much of an issue this was for our kids. So we were two, two, years into, uh, two years into our clinical practice, and I had my research assistant go through and pull every single chart. And we developed a, a checklist, which is what was the uh, slide before, um, with all of the ACE uh, criteria. And then uh, we developed, uh, we also added what we called plus one criteria, which were things that we thought would also activate um, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So something that had things that I believed had the same mechanism of action um, that of uh, chronic stress leading to HPA axis dysregulation, hyperactivity of the amygdala, underactivity of the prefrontal cortex, things like homelessness, things like witness to community violence, et cetera. And so I would score, we scored every kid and did, um, and they would have the score, their score was four, or their score was four plus two, or their score was seven plus two, or whatever it was. And we found that among our population, it was very similar to um, that of the ACE study. 67.2% had a, sc a score of at least one, 12% had a score of four or more. And that was in the retrospective chart review um, in which I wasn't at the time, screening for ACEs. This is just what was documented in the chart, right? Documented in the chart that was disclosed by the caregiver to me, a mandated, re mandated reporter, right, about what was going on with the kids. And we found that for our kids with an ACE score of four or more, um, uh, it, they were twice as likely to be overweight or obese, and they were 32.6 as likely, 32.6 uh, times as likely to have uh, learning or behavior problems in school. And those are the two things um, that we correlated against. And uh, what was interesting about it was that for our kids who had the ACE score of zero, uh, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems in school. For those who had, uh, so we saw the same dose response relationship. And for our ACE score of four more, 51.2% of them had learning and behavior problems in school. And this was really powerful because it told me that our low-income black and brown kids did not, did not inherently 
uh, have uh, problems learning, right? So that I, th only 3% of our low income black and brown kids who had an ACEs score of zero had uh, problems learning. So that was really, that was really powerful um, to see. And so we developed a clinical protocol. And our clinical protocol was simply this. If your ACEs score is zero, awesome, thrilled. One to three with symptoms, do anticipatory guidance. The reason is because it's really hard to get families uh, in to do supplemental th um, therapy and all that kind of stuff if the kid doesn't have any symptoms. Now, unless the parent is really interested, but uh, anticipatory guidance was kind of the place that we started. One to three with symptoms, we refer to multidisciplinary rounds, and four or more, regardless of symptoms, we would refer to multidisciplinary rounds so we could try to engage. We just have been going back, our clinical team now is going back to try and revise this process and, um, and be a little bit more thoughtful about it. Before we were doing uh, universal screening, but it's hard to do universal screening at every well child check. And so sometimes it doesn't get done and then it's hard to know whether you're doing it or not. So we have recently just set a protocol of the first screening must be done by nine months with a second screening at four years, which is at the time of kindergarten re readiness because we know about the impact of learning and behavior and then Q3 years thereafter, right? Because if it's at every well child check, particularly if the answer is, if, if, if the, the score is zero, right? Then the next year they come well child check. Okay, have you been abused? Have you been this? Have you, it, so it, it, it becomes a lot. So having some type of chronicity, this is what we've adopted. And I started with something called gateway questions, which was, remember we started with just a checklist that came out of our retrospective chart review, and so, I would get through all the stuff on the checklist, but I didn't go through and screen and say, has your child been physically abused, sexually abused, emotionally abused? Like I didn't, I didn't do that. We, I, I noticed that in my own personal script, I said, hey, did you notice your child having any learning or behavior problems? Just because of the data that came out of our study, um, I uh, knew that that was an indicator. The next was, who lives at home? Has anyone come or gone from the household lately? Concerns about sleep or bedwetting, so that was the developmental regression, which is something that we see as a c common clinical symptom. And has your child ever witnessed violence either at home or in the community? And so those were some of the, the gateway questions that we started with. Uh, I look for uh, clinical symptoms. And, um, and since we've developed the Center for Youth Wellness, so I've transitioned out of my role as a medical director of the Bayview Child Health Center. We've developed the Center for Youth Wellness, and the whole purpose is to further this work. It's essentially a subspecialty clinic for ACEs and toxic stress. And this is our clinical model, including a biopsychosocial assessment, home visits, referrals, psychotherapy, psychiatry, biofeedback, exercise, mindfulness and coping, and tracking of biologic markers. And I wanted to uh, take a quick second. Um, for a question and answer, because I think that's the thing that's helpful and useful, and I probably only have two minutes left, but uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Go ahead. How do you differentiate the, the question, the question is how do you get it paid for? So uh, I hear the Gates Foundation is in the house. No. <laughs> We, we, have for, uh, we have been entirely privately, philanthropically funded so far. Um, and it's and a big, I spend a lot of my time fundraising, which sucks. Um, but at the same time, I do believe that fundraising is awareness raising, and so that's really important. Um, but the whole model, that's why we need all pieces of the puzzle, including the policy work, right? We need to do proof of concept. When we develop a real clinical model, do proof of concept, and then give it to the policy folks and let you all run downhill so that we can get this paid for because all of our public payers need to be paying for this. Go ahead. Um, so our, our clinical interventions are uh, developmentally tailored. So for our zero to five-year-olds, we use um, uh, child-parent psychotherapy, and it's really, it's dyadic work, and it's um, focused on the parent history of trauma and how that relates to their parenting. 
for um, starting at about six is really when you can start doing uh, some of the biofeedback work. And it works great, actually, um, in, in kids who are curious about their bodies. Really, six to 12 is a great uh, time for that. And then in adolescents and older, you're able to do more um, insight-oriented work and use, make better use of that prefrontal cortex and, um, and, and do some of the mindfulness and movement work. That's, you know what, that's a, such a great question. The CPS reporting is always um, the big question. And it's almost, it's very rare that I have had a CPS report come out of an ACE screen. Um, and, uh, and the simple reason is most of the time for our kids, um, it's already been reported. It's reported acutely when it happens. It's not that common that uh, a kid comes in and, you know, um, for a well child check, and I say, "Has there ever been any? Has your child ever been harmed?" And the answer is, you know, yeah, pops beat him up last night. Rarely is that the case. More often, it's the case that um, they, and it, and if that's the case, and I think that people are afraid of reporting that reason. If that's the case. It needed to be reported because there was a child who was being abused and it was never reported. So we need to, I feel like we need to get over that CPS reporting fear and recognize most of the time um, that's not the issue. Most of the time it's uh, validation and recognition of the reality that to that child is living with. Thank you. Well, and I'm uh, out of time. Thanks. Well, when you throw, you'll be around. You're not going anywhere. Uh, yeah, and I'm speaking tonight too. I have a lot more to say, but apparently I got to say it all we tonight. Wanna, we want to hear it, and we want to hear it. But we want to. Thank you. And if you can, if you can use the microphone so everyone can hear your question, that would be great. Like I'm doing. Reported. Uh, and turn it on. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Roberta Wade. I'm a registered nurse at Drexel University. And I am so excited to be here today to really share with all of you what our team is doing at the 11th Street Family Health Center, particularly focusing on holistic health practices, because we really think it has significant implications for ACEs. And I'm gonna share some of the things that we're doing, many of the things that we started, we did before we replicated the ACE study, but then we also have advanced and um, increased some of our modalities since finding out our findings and the significance of the mind-body modalities that are very useful. So at the 11th Street Family Health Center, um, which is part of Drexel University, and we have a link collaboration with the Family Practice and Counseling Network, we are FQHC, and we are a medical home. And we offer services annually um, in 2012 to almost 10,000 patients. And our approach to care really is integrated. We really focus on seamless, coordinated care that can try and address as much physiological as well as psychosocial needs for our children, adults, and families that we provide services for. And this just gives you sort of a distant view of some of the programs and services. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about these and then break down some of the programs that really are significant for um, ACES as well. So we have many different departments that work collaborative, collaboratively together. Primary care, of course, is central. And this is the hub of our FQHC. Our family nurse practitioners are there. We have specialist services that come in, cardiology, ophthalmology. We have a complementary and integrated therapist. We have a fitness trainer. Um, because we're linked to an academic center, we also are able to use a lot of those um, services from the school. So we have complementary and alternative um, therapy modalities, such as dance movement therapy, music therapy, um, significant screening, 
transitional care services. And because my talk is going to be a little bit brief, one of the programs that I'm going to really highlight is our Growing Together program, which really its foundation is focused on the Centering Pregnancy program, but we call it Growing Together because we work with mothers um, while they're pregnant and then also as parents after the children are born. So we bring families back in again. We have other um, providers such as our behavioral health consultants, which are integrated in the primary care. Um, we started doing this probably about five to seven years ago. Uh, we have uh, focused programs on our, with our teens, smoke and secession programs. We have screening, brief intervention, and referral treatments, as well as a lot of wellness programs um, for our women um, and programs for power over pain. So this just sort of gives you a glimpse of some of the um, providers, as well as many of the services that we provide within primary care. The thing doesn't want to move. Oh, there we go. We also um, have nurse family partnerships that work with us, and they're a critical piece, again, for prevention, which we heard yesterday in some of our talks. We have, in addition to our integrated behavioral health consultants that we have within primary care, we also have our outpatient traditional um, behavioral health, which entails our licensed clinical social workers, our psychiatrists, and our psychologists. And they offer individual as well as family therapy. I had mentioned earlier we have a creative arts um, therapies, which has dance movement therapy. Um, we also have porch light. <coughs> excuse me, which focuses on the mural arts. Um, and uh, Lindsay Meeks is in charge of that, and that's really been advancing significantly, much more since, again, since we've um, learned more about our ACEs and replicating the study. We have a generalist social worker, which is really key, which helps and works with throughout the center um, in providing transportation and follow-up when we're talking about insurance, trying to get coverage. Uh, is really significant. Within this department also, we have linkages for our families with our, uh, from our law school, which helps with um, living wills, power of attorney, disability services, and a lot of these factors come into play when you're working with adults as well that are impacted by ACEs. So we're able to look at these things from a very wide life course perspective. Some of the other things that we offer at the center to try and make things very seamless and coordinated is pharmacy, physical therapy, which is supported through the College of Nursing and Health Professions, as well as dental. And one of the last biggest areas is our health outreach, which is so key. We work a lot individually, health consultants. We have our mindfulness training there. Our complementary integrative therapist has been working with us for a while. But again, this is a really key area that has grown significantly, um, where now we even offer trauma-informed yoga. So we, she offers yoga, Reiki, individual stress management consultation. And the real beauty of these things are these modalities are not only just for the clients, they're for staff at the health center as well. Uh, reflexology, again, uh, meditation, mindfulness, stress reduction workshops. She works with our clients and families individually as well as in groups. We have a fitness trainer who offers very different types of programs for exercising, which is really key when we're talking about our body as a living body and really trying to work a lot of these issues out, such as The Biggest Loser, <coughs> um, Way in Wednesdays, cooking classes, um, as well as thank you as well as um, nutrition is really huge. We have farm the families and we even have a, a small garden um, on our land that our youth as well as our elders work together and they grow vegetables um, in that area. So key, even though we don't um, resolve everything, I think we offer a lot of things for the children, adults, and a single place in addition to our collaboration with many other organizations such as ChildLink, our daycares, our boys and girls clubs, because again, it's important to have those collaborations as well. What we really want to do is we want to support overall community wellness. Um, and this was really key, particularly, and I'm going to talk a little bit next in reference to our 
uh, implications for ACEs from our replication study, but I also wanted to highlight some of the things that we're doing, particularly at the health center that has moved us forward. Over the past several years, we've had a relationship with Dr. Sandy Bloom, who we heard just recently, and from that education, we have moved forward now where we're undergoing sanctuary training. So we're working really closely with the Andrews Center and Sandy's team, and so we're really trying to address um, uh, the trauma from an uh, organizational standpoint, not just an individual provider to client standpoint. Another initiative that um, is really important to us, and we think that with the collaboration and the learning centers, we're going to continue to um, learn more, is that we've just also been part, brought in as part of Project LEAP, um, which, are, which essentially is learning from effective ambulatory um, uh, ambulatory practices, and we were selected one of 30 healthcare centers, and so we're going to be able to share some of our best practices and also learn from other learning communities for how we can move things forward and even really looking at ACEs and what other primary care um, centers are doing. So looking specifically at ACEs, between 2009 and 2010, Dr. Garrity, two research co-ops, as well as myself, we replicated the ACEs study using the traditional um, scale that was um, used by Kaiser and the CDC. And for one year, we um, took retrospective surveys from adults 18 years of age and older. 801 adults participate, voluntarily participated in the study. And what you can see here from the findings, and we have it broken down here by gender, but then if you look at the last column, it shows you the total. So in reflecting on the information from yesterday, yesterday we saw what the ACEs were from the original study, and we have it up here as well. So what you can see is a lot of our patients are impacted by cumulative exposure to ACEs. Almost 50% had four or more. Um, with one, it was 6.3%, 6, 6 um, I'm sorry, 0, 6.3%, 1, 12%, 2, 17.8%, 3, 14.8%, 3, and again, almost half um, had four or more ACEs. Uh, so I think this is a common theme that we've picked up even in listening to the information that some of the other urban centers have um, discussed yesterday. When I took a look at to see what were some of the top, when we're looking at the 10 individual ACEs, these were the top um, factors for the men and women <coughs> um, that took part in this study of the 801 patients. And of the 801, uh, it was a three to one ratio with women to, uh, women to men. So there were more women who participated in the study than men. So what I'm going to do now, just to let you know, I got my five-minute sign here, and I want to have a couple minutes for um, talking. So I'm just going to briefly go through the next slides, a couple slides, just to show you, um, particularly regarding our Growing Together program. And the 11th Street Family Health Center, really, I put this in here because the, we, the, the community sees the health center as a safe place. And again, we offer programs from um, youth all the way up. And one of the programs I really wanted to talk about that is so significant when we're talking about prevention, um, intergenerational transmission, is our Growing Together program. Again, its foundation is based on the Centering Program, if many of you are familiar with that. Um, but the whole fidelity to the model, we actually worked with our women who was part of the program and changed it because we did something different. We had a nurse that was included, and we also had a pediatric behavioral health consultant, which is quite different, that helps in running these programs. And the Grown Together program, the focus is that it's patient-centered, it's group setting, so it's not individual care that our women come in when they're pregnant. It's all delivered in, in groups, um, which provides more time with practitioners as well as relationship building with the behavioral health consultants and the families as well. And this starts before the, the women um, give birth. So this is really significant. Um, so there is significance as far as uh, Assessment is done, a significant amount of education is provided, support, and again, it's interdisciplinary as far as the team members who take part um, in the program. For the growing together, the parenting section, so, section, so this is when the women come back um, after delivering and both, even though we say um, 
mom baby dyads really it's for the family because fathers are there it depends on who the women identify as um, significant supports it could be grandparents it could be aunts brothers um, but quite often we do get partners who come in with the women which is wonderful and that helps to foster stronger relationships between the providers again and the parents Uh, we get to see the dynamics and interactions uh, developmentally for the children, as well as siblings that may come in and in our interaction with the babies. Um, and so when the babies come in, they are grouped by age uh, in about six to eight pairs. And again, it's the two hour time frame that takes place. We use a family-focused um, approach from pregnancy through well-child care. Um, and it really helps us really see the developmental um, progress of the babies longitudinally. And these are just some of the things that we really work with with the moms, the contraception, weight management, depression. Also in the pregnancy part, that's where we really focus on and doing the screening for ACEs during that time. And it's just wonderful just seeing the attachment and the bonding with the, um, with the parents and the babies. So I'm going to um, cut it short there because I want to at least have a minute or two for questions um, because I'm out of time. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. How do you work with child care centers through your, your group? Well, um, our behavioral health consultants and our nurses go out and work with the child care centers that are in the area. We have one primarily that's in our area to build those connections, um, particularly encouraging trying to have the families come in for care there as well because we're right there in the area. Thank you. We have one, though, immediately within our area. One, yes. more, one more question? Can you, no. can you repeat the question? Yes. Are we seeing any changes in health care utilization? We have increased utilization. Um, we are really at capacity right now for our space um, that we have. So we really try and focus so much of our attention on the patients that come to us consistently so we can actually evaluate and look at a lot of the outcomes with their health measures as well as the programs that we're using. And it's really important, particularly when we're looking at those policy issues that Nadine was talking about, because we have to show the cost-benefit analysis. All of these health promotion programs that we have, they are funded um, through private foundations that Dr. Garrity has to seek funding for. They're not supported. So insurance currently does not reimburse us for those health promotion programs. They only, we only get reimbursed for the FQHC services within um, the, with the family nurse practitioners and primary care. For our, um, our integrated behavioral health consultants, we get reimbursement for the brief therapy. But for all of our other services that we provide currently, they are not reimbursed. They are supported, which we're going to continue to do because we just have to, again, lay that case for that cost-benefit um, part of it. And we want to really take a look at what are these, how are these health outcomes um, changing for our adults as well as for our children as well as for our adolescents. So we look at it from birth all the way up from a life course perspective. So our time is up. I'll be more than happy, myself or Dr. Garrity, in answering any questions that you may have at lunchtime or later this evening. And, and there will be a short period of question and answer for the whole panel after the panel's done. So okay. just so you know. Fred, I'm going to need to work a little bit from script just to not say too much <laughs> is what clicks it. Okay, so I'm here partly on behalf of the Pediatric Integrated Care Collaborative, which I'll mention a little bit more, and also the main resilience building network that Sue Mackey Andrews introduced yesterday. 
Uh, and so I uh, really want to thank you for the invitation to come to Philadelphia. Uh, especially grateful because uh, my remarks here uh, probably result from some volunteer placements with the Einstein Community Mental Health Center and some work with self-guiding speech and social problem solving in preschoolers at Hahnemann Medical Center during an undergraduate urban studies semester over 40 years ago that caught the attention of the faculty at the University of Rochester and tipped my graduate school application into the, let's interview this guy, uh, pile, uh, thereby enabling my career in child clinical psychology. So thank you, Philadelphia. <laughs> I understand that the slides are going to be on the website at some point before too long, so I'm mostly wanting to give you a tour of what to look for later, and especially what to email me about with questions, because I'm enthused about too much to say in 10 to 12 minutes. Um, This begins with just the visual impact of the A slides. Uh, the odds ratios uh, that have become uh, so compelling, uh, and it just lists as you go up a variety of kind of negative health and behavior outcomes, how the odds increase with four or more ACEs. But what we want to do is uh, go beyond the adult outcomes and ask what's going on for zero to 18 year olds. It's hard as a child serving person to see the ACE scores and not wonder what could we be doing before all those bad things happen. So within the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, of which probably half a dozen of us are in the room, uh, and you could understand in terms of that spider web of networking that we saw as we opened the summit that similar kind of spider web of probably over 150, 200 sites now over the last 12 years or so, learned that with about 9,000 kids, uh, the more trauma categories you have out of 20 in their system, uh, your problem scores on the child behavior checklist go up. The kinds of behavior problems you have in home, school, community, daycare, uh, problems in attachment, problems in developing sexually inappropriate behaviors, those go up with a adversity exposure. Uh, and even in child health, we're starting to see problems accumulating with risk uh, in suicidality, self-injury, substance use, alcohol use. So obviously, the problems are showing up even before kids hit 18, and certainly before they become 50, the average age for the study. And if you looked at cumulative risk, again, and tracked it with the UCLA PTSD reaction index, uh, and even going up to 10 of the 20 categories, you see the impairment go up with that too. So uh, this is not a surprise, it's just a way to say the effects are already showing up in childhood. And so that left us to try to make sense out of this somehow, and one place to begin is with the ACE pyramid of illness. And as you know, it's how adverse child experiences can lead to some kind of neuro, bio, psycho, social, would be my uh, abbreviation for that, impairment, uh, some of which produces health problems on its own in terms of Im immunological kinds of difficulties, cardiovascular and so on, and also produce problems in terms of unhealthy coping with that kind of impairment, which leads to premature illness. So this is nothing new for you, but it sets the stage for uh, wondering about how is it that people become ill. So this is just take one of the odds ratios. Uh, this happens to be for were you depressed in the last two weeks. And the pathogenesis question is, if you're under the curve, that means you have that problem and your risk for that goes up with cumulative ACEs. Um, but there's uh, another side to the question, and that's to ask, what's going on for the people who stay healthy? So one of the messages from the ACE study, at least the data that we have, is except for injected drug use, I think, uh, if you have more, four or more ACEs, you're more likely to be healthy than you are to have the problem. Uh, and so how do people stay healthy? That leads us to wonder uh, about a resilience or a wellness pyramid where protective and promotive child experiences in family and community lead to resilience expectations which support learning and using healthy coping strategies 
and result in wellness. So you can think of a wellness pyramid to complement the ACE pyramid. Uh, and uh, proposing that it's important to think of both of those at the same time. So a way to understand who develops the negative outcomes with ACE exposure may have something to do with how resilient they are and what kind of protective experiences they have. And so you really want to assess and intervene, take into account both sides of that. And recognize they both, both pyramids sit on a foundation of community environment. So uh, when you think about how do we provide health care around ACEs, it might be that some of us do that with the social part of impairment, some of us do it with the biological side and maybe provide, deal with surgery, medical treatment. Others might deal with psychological uh, complications and others might deal with the neurology of that or psychiatric uh, medication just to oversimplify this. But it's important probably to move toward coordinating all of that and uh, helping the psychosocial side oops, uh, be more health informed and helping the health side be more trauma informed and moving beyond just coordination to all be better relationship informed by bringing the parents onto the team and focusing on parent-child relationships. Um, how do you pay for that? Uh, this is, uh, the curves are my imagination, but if you were to say, what are some of the chronic conditions that lead to uh, expense uh, that might be stress related, we could ask, like we do with the adult ACEs, uh, how much ADHD, asthma, sleep, depression, diabetes, psychological problems are due to stress, unresolved, unsoothed, how could we intervene with that, what would we save, and how could the return on uh, six, $10 billion for asthma if one, two, five percent of that were preventable. So uh, that, in terms of health reform, is a way of wondering how do you do the triple aim of better health with better health care at better cost, and that's part of what our breakthrough series is trying to look at and address those key questions, and that's part of what you can do uh, on the website with slides ask how do we become better health informed, how do medical services be better trauma informed, how do all of us become better relationship informed, and one of the ways to do that is to be able to screen, and part of what we're experimenting with in Maine and other places is to do a non-specific ACE screen where you just uh, ask how many of these 10 have you experienced, just put marks in the circle because in our first contact we don't need to know which ones we just <laughs> medically and in terms of planning need to know how many, your A score. But then to ask how many of them still bother you because that may actually be the indicator that relates to health outcomes and the possibility that some, some of them don't bother you anymore means you can then ask a question of how is it that some of those don't bother you anymore. So let's focus on your coping and your strength. Then if there's something left over to focus on with uh, illness or stress, we now have a relationship that we can do that with. Uh, and all this builds on uh, Jack and Andy's work with toxic stress, followed by Sarah Johnson's work on neuroimmune system complications. And I want to show you one or two last slides, just to give you a, a sense of where could you go in terms of transforming how we think about all this and why bother with resilience. We're used to the fight or flight stress response system where there's a risk, a problem, we mobilize, cortisol is secreted and it goes back down to baseline. Uh, that's what we hope usually happens. We deal with stress and it's over with. But sometimes that doesn't get turned off. It doesn't get soothed and we end up with chronic stress and lots of problems that relate to cortisol in the system too long to oversimplify it. Um, another stress response system is we shut down. This is mostly another talk, but what I want to clue you in too is there's a third stress response system uh, that Stephen Porges in two articles in 04 and 11 talk about in terms of how we engage socially to solve problems that involves the parasympathetic arousal system. Uh, it's how we ask is this a stressful situation? Is there danger here? It's basically how an infant asks parent, uh, is this stress? Should I be upset? 
It's how parent then communicates, no, you're safe, and in doing so, inhibits the fight or flight system, uh, uh, blocks the immobilized system, and keeps the cortisol from staying chronic. So in a sense, we have a neurobiopsychosocial way of thinking about resilience, uh, and it's what our grandmothers knew. Uh, basically, this social engagement system is attachment. Uh, that builds the brain pathways for attachment, that builds the neuroimmune system for that, that builds the expectations of I'm lovable, capable, meaningful, and safe, and have that happen in an interaction. So uh, I invite you to follow up on the website or catch me later this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Mark, Mark there's, there is time for some questions if you want. Well, you can take it from your seat, whatever you're more comfortable with. This doesn't mean I can do the other five pages, I don't think. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Um. Yes. Yeah. This. The su a summit website, the Institute for Safe Families. And, and one of you, you saw one of the slides is a bibliography for some of them, but uh, I didn't think I would uh, include the Porges slide, uh, so I left those references off. Uh, but with the previous presentations today, I thought, well, we need to uh, be sure there's more for you to look into about that in terms of transforming things, Sandy's position and the, the work on resilience and, and so on. Okay, thank well, you. thanks to my colleagues from Dave Corwin, who did the ACES DVD in 2005, that was my first exposure to this, to the colleagues who will be working with us on the Integrated Care Collaborative to the future. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. I'm here to wrap up to really tell you a story about uh, the, this booklet, which is in your bag. And I'd like to start by thanking, I think Joe Pyle might uh, be out of the room, but uh, the Scattergood Foundation, because I think the work that all of us are doing in this room and beyond is very reflective of what Thomas Scattergood uh, believed in, compassionate care, whether we're talking about mental health problems or ACEs. And I also believe that it's the type of creative, collaborative leadership that I experienced through this fellowship that really is going to allow us to reach our dreams and do what we want to do. So there we go. I'm here, but the reality is, is that this booklet, uh, partnering uh, with parents, is all about a whole bunch of people, many hands, many great minds who are in this room. And the thing is, when we talk about reviewers and contributors, it wasn't just one time. There were many, many iterations that we went through with this. And uh, while Martha Davis was doing focus groups with uh, the classes that she teaches, I spend a lot of time on planes, as you might imagine, sometimes big planes. And I, I'm actually a little shy, but I, since I was a child, I loved talking to total strangers, which freaked my mom out. <laughs> but uh, jets are wonderful for that. But then also, I'm on a lot of small planes, you know, like three-seaters, four-seaters. And there I could corner people. <laughs> and uh, are you a parent? <laughs> you know, and uh, we, we, got, we talked to a lot of people. We got a lot of input. Uh, but we, it's a, this is a dynamic document. While it's printed, we know that it will go through more iterations and change as we learn more from you and more for the people that we're going to be uh, using, talking to about this and working with it. So why an educational resource for parents? Why do we go that route? Hopefully a lot of you are familiar with the Institute for Safe Families plat uh, Partnering with Parents platform, which is about teaching uh, or uh, working with, really, parents uh, and educators around understanding the impact of violence on children. And I want to emphasize, because you may be surprised when you looked at the ACE questions, that we include physical punishment in there. And uh, that's uh, one of a major resource that's on this website for partnering with parents, is that we wanted to expand the continuum to also look at the mountain of research, what we've learned around physical punishment. We wanted to 
be trauma informed and meet parents where they are at. I think that's been the most the biggest learning moment, maybe tipping point in my career, is that we can have great parenting interventions and programs and re resources and such, but we have to recognize where people are at. I learned it in domestic violence and I very much have learned it in the ACEs work too. So it's about a trauma-informed approach and in that arena. If we want to be able to convey the messages. If p the parent can't self-regulate, how can the child learn to self-regulate? And how do we talk about the resiliency needed for that parent and where they're at in terms of their trauma to be the parent kind of parent that they want to be? Uh, increasing awareness, self-understanding, and I had to go back and add yesterday because I, I so believe it, I so feel it, it's why I can do the work I do, but I really appreciated when Dr. Ando was talking about hope. It's what we can't measure and it's the biggest p-value of all, right? And uh, so that drives the, the work and we hope that it's reflected in this resource. And because we know that effective prevention is multimodal, multi-contextual, this, we hope, is one piece in moving us towards really talking about primary prevention, which I've heard so much in this room over the last day and a half, because that's really where we want to be going, and that is partially empowering through knowledge and understanding. There are lots of p-values in this, although you might not see them in the sense that it's informed by the research that so many of you in this room have done, but also, of course, that critical evidence of what we've learned through practice. Uh, in terms of the science, certainly the ACE study, developmental neuroscience, that helps us, they, as one parent said to me, the brain explains, and it really does. The biology of toxic stress, social emotional learning, attachment theory, theory self-regulation skills, parenting principles uh, to minim uh, minimize toxic stress and promote healthy brain development. But the real challenge here, too, was when we talk in our world about the terminology, ACEs, toxic stress, uh, resiliency, big words, what do they mean? So how do we do this, frankly, without using those words? And our goal was to get to the fifth grade uh, reading level, which is what we've done with the other amazing brain booklets. So simple uh, language and avoiding stigmatizing language. And the key characteristics, and uh, this is definitely the, the brilliance of others, when uh, talking to therapists and uh, parents and so forth, it's like, give me an app, technology. Uh, not particularly where my brain lives, but certainly where the world is going and who do we want to be reaching, especially young parents and such. So the concept was to design this to look like an app, to have the QR codes so that those codes that you see in the booklet can just be scanned right in to access that website, to go to that tactical breather app. Uh, they have the resources quickly accessible. A positive approach that, set, that acknowledges parenting is hard work. We know that every parent is trying to do their best. And then how can we encourage that was skill, building for, uh, skill building, building for resiliency for parents and children? And so this was another change I added yesterday because I love the terminology, Laura, I believe, in the uh, dual, generation, uh, dual uh, generation approach that it's a, uh, what I learned again in my work, it's a package deal. Your focus may be the child or your focus may be the uh, adult victim of domestic violence or whatever it is, the reality is we're working with the family, the parents and the children and we will be most effective when we work with them together. So <clears throat> the Part of the big question in process, and, uh, and this very much was uh, process, was should we be talking about a screening tool or a resource? And where we landed is where we've landed before in terms of the emphasis on universal education. Uh, and then with some embedded self-assessment for ACEs in the resource. 
Uh, we, as dialogue continues around the issues of uh, to screen or not to screen in the pediatric setting and how to do it, we know there's going to be lots of different approaches and we hope that maybe this can be a tool that will facilitate those different approaches. And it's very much informed by the work too that we've seen around uh, in my, my world of domestic violence screening and such. I think it was quite enlightening when we saw the last systematic evidence review for domestic violence screening by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, really looking at more and more of the research that we didn't think was going to be the case in, uh, early on, that self-administered assessment can be very effective, sometimes more effective. Certainly the ACEs data shows us uh, that it works. And then there's been a huge paradigm in the shift and uh, Rebecca Levinson with Future Without Violence, the creative genius behind the uh, safety card and then Liz Miller who's here in Pennsylvania at Pitt and has uh, done the incredible randomized controlled trial evaluations of these cards really caused a paradigm shift in our field to realize the effectiveness of using, again, this universal education with embedded assessment uh, in it and uh, the, these little cards. So uh, we've learned a lot and we're trying to build on that. And something that we did, uh, it's actually similar to the National Survey for Children's Health and you'll see it in some other questionnaires too, but relative to this resource is we lifted out que the questions uh, specific to child abuse and neglect. Instead, we discussed those issues and uh, don't have specific questions, thank you, in, uh, the, in the tool but rather talk about it and then added some emerging ACEs. So you can look at all the questions in the tool, uh, but you know we start with the questions that are very familiar to you relative to uh, the ACE study and uh, then as you go further down, uh, you'll see some other questions that are, are add-ons in terms of exposure to community violence, which uh, was part of the Philadelphia ACEs, also the uh, WHO ACE International Questionnaire, uh, placed in foster care, being bullied, uh, the issue of being treated uh, badly or unfairly because of ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, disability, and uh, such, and then what did uh, surprise some folks initially were that we put in some questions about physical punishment, which I think America continues to lag behind the world uh, on really being forthright about this and the implications of it. And uh, like uh, everyone else has talked about, and uh, we believe in too, an emphasis on resiliency. So uh, the question's also about uh, protective factors and resiliency, uh, and that uh, bringing in that hope again and asking parents what helped them, and then focusing on some very specific skill building for uh, parents to use with examples for kids around resiliency. And our next steps are uh, piloting uh, use in a variety of child care uh, settings. We think that there will be a shorter version to get it down to the first grade reading level. Uh, we're going to look at the possibility of translating into an app. Um, you might have just gotten a big order from us uh, for more resiliency cards. That's for our prison-based ACEs education program. Dave, you just got a big order too. <laughs> so um, the, we're uh, taking it wherever we go. And in closing, I'd just like to say it's um, all about team Work. This is my uh, dog team and what I learned after uh, breaking my knee and uh, being told I'd never be able to ski again with no road to my homestead at the time and trying to think of how I was going to get home from Johns Hopkins. I came up with this idea and it's worked great because what I've realized is I've gone to places with those dogs I'd never get to myself and that's what this room is all about. So thank you. <laughs> We have some time for questions for Linda. I guess my, my first question is, how much do they charge you to park that at the airport? <laughs> Pardon? How much do they charge you to park the dog, dogs at the airport? Yeah, yeah, that's my dilemma. <laughs> so are there, are there questions for Linda? And then we're going to have time for a panel. We'll have time for a panel discussion as well. Okay, and you know that, that booklet is in your um, bags, along with the other Amazing Brain uh, booklet. So I'll, um, ask, I'll step up and kind of moderate the questions. Okay, so now this is time when we're kind of synthesizing um, all of the implementation aspects of 
uh, this, and, and you can now please use your microphone to ask the question, or I will repeat the question uh, if I can hear it, just because we are being recorded and it is um, uh, for perpetuity. So questions in the audience? And just hold the mic close. I, I just want to, I want to start by saying you guys are all doing incredibly wonderful work and you're clearly making a lot of progress. <laughs> it's clear that we're making advances in terms of identifying and responding and supporting and helping kids and families who are experiencing the consequences of these, ex of these exposures. I'm curious about your thoughts with respect to reducing the exposures in the first place and reducing the flow of kids into your system who need um, all these services. Mine may be a little bit brief, but I think it really gets back to a lot of the prevention and starting with the families, um, you know, early on. And so it is working a lot with the, the the um, parents and the families and so one of the targeted areas that I highlighted was the Growing Together program because you can do some form of intervention there even the awareness of what's taken place what has happened in the mom's um, um, life what is going on in the mom's or and or family's life because that's the environment that that baby is going to be growing up in so I think that's a critical um, and pivotal area to start. I, I would add that um, when, when we look at response to ACEs, we, we need a, f like a f complete spectrum of a response, right? And so I often uh, use the analogy that um, for other clinical care, we have, um, you know, uh, we have the outpatient clinic, we have the inpatient clinic, we have the ICU, and we have, a, you know, we have the ER. We have an understanding that there's um, a, a full spectrum of care and that you may have to go kind of graduate up and down between care. And I think that um, um, we, we, ne we clearly need to have the primary prevention, and that includes, you know, increased awareness and parents' understanding and um, positive parenting and all, and all of those types of things. But we, we also need to have um, the, the rest of the spectrum, which is mm -hmm. um, uh, protocols and tools for early detection. And so that if a, when a child has an ACE score of two, right, I don't, I can, I, we can see them then and detect it and do uh, psychoeducation with parents and do um, early intervention to mitigate the symptoms in the child. And then, uh, so hopefully that child doesn't go on to develop an ACE score of four, right? And so uh, that work is really important. And for the kids who have an ACE score of four or six or um, eight, right, we, we need to have the appropriate interventions then. But you, you wouldn't have a ward and, and, and not have an ICU. And similarly, we can't have um, uh, only primary and secondary prevention. We need kind of the full spectrum. Uh, and Mark. Okay. And I think this is a place where we may not have all the clinical data but want to look for it or keep moving to say it may not be the ACE that you have but whether it still bothers you that's the key thing and we may be able to intervene better with helping people go from bothered to not bothered and you could look for the University of Minnesota study on resilience into adulthood to how people get a sense of coherence about their ACE history and keep that from interrupting their parenting. We can also build resilience in children along the way, and there's, there's ways to, to do that. And if we can do that, then maybe we prevent the ACEs for the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think um, a lot of the work we saw yesterday around the data collection, I think as more people, more and more people are asking about this, we'll understand some of the hot spots in communities where ACEs are high, and then the prevention can occur at a community level, um, which is what I think uh, also addresses the issue, because that's a transgenerational issue. Right here. Uh, Dr. Burke, oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Burke, when um, Paul Tuff did that wonderful article on you in, the, in New Yorker, um, the one thing that struck me was your statement about how when you first discovered this ACEs connection, I think you said you could hear the angels singing. Uh, I'd really like you to elaborate a little bit on that and how we could maybe find ways to get that to the rest of the medical community, that kind of, that kind of feeling. Um, 
Um, uh, thank you. I, um, I think like uh, we've heard, I, like uh, many of you and like we've heard previous uh, speakers say before, it's kind of like you read the ACES data and you're like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. And in fact, um, at one point, I think Paul <laughs> quoted me as saying, I, it felt like that moment of Neo in the Matrix where you can like all of a sudden see like the whole world is made of like ones and zeros. You're like, <laughs> you know, it was just like, oh my God, I, this, I see this everywhere and everything is made out of this. Um, and, and, and so that was, that was uh, pretty amazing. And I think that um, when it comes to the, the rest of the medical community, um, I, my experience is that folks are willing to s understand, um, yeah, that there's a preponderance of data at this point, but the what do we do about it now is still a big question mark. And uh, my, my talk uh, this evening, I will, <laughs> I will say, you know, Mar Martha and I talked and I said, you know, ACEs, why every, um, why every clinician should care. And then I, I went back and I actually changed it. And I, I said, it's actually ACEs, why every clinician shouldn't have to care. How can we create this as just start part of standard of care? And that requires folks to understand what they need to do, and it needs to be simple, straightforward, and and um, uh, you know not too challenging for your average clinician. And so, figuring out how to get to that, right? We're in the process. All of the folks who are in this room are working on how do we get to that. So, uh, Joe, pediatrician who's in private practice, who really doesn't um, uh, isn't part too too particularly passionate about ACEs per se, feels that it's his or her job to screen and understands that there are some basic things that they can do once they've identified it. Hi, my question is about um, what mechanisms do you have in place for getting participant feedback and then what do you do with that feedback when you receive it? And I guess, I, participant feedback from? Whether they're your patients or in a community-based setting, whether the families you're working with or whoever your participant population is. I think at the community level, we we immediately see the response, something like the <coughs> Annette story. Um, every single opportunity that we have, whether it's um, doing our work in our neighborhoods that are most isolated, um, either because of income or ethnicity, um, we, we just get that immediate feedback of why didn't I know this sooner. Uh, so it, the brain explains is a great way to say that too. People instantly understand that they've been impacted, but they didn't understand why and now they do. We do more formal evaluations with our trainings with teachers. We're doing um, focus groups and interviews with our alternative high school where we've seen such a change in discipline philosophy. Um, all discipline is now handled in school. There's no more out of school suspension, unless it's an emergency suspension. So we do have that type of evaluation, but most of it's just immediate feedback of how come I didn't know this sooner. We just did some um, big training up at our Washington State Penn, uh, because we do have a pen in town, and one of the guards walked up to me after our three hours of training, and he said, I, I just found out now from you I have six aces and I'm on my fourth marriage. I really would wish I hadn't had to do the four marriages. I think within the Breakthrough Series Collaborative Model hosted at uh, Johns Hopkins Public Health, it's a small test of change. How does this work and how do I get feedback about that quickly and move on? And one of the things to pilot with that is to ask, is our, our settings trauma-informed, resilience-informed? And, and a simple way to say that would include being a safe place to be, a trustworthy relationship, a place that works on family goals gives them choices and embodies teamwork. And we can ask, did we do a great job of that? Uh, kind of get a report card back or say, we don't do a great job with everybody for everything, but did we do a good enough job so that you came out of this screening or intervention or something better than you came into it? Or did we just sort of do a neutral job that maybe not everybody on the team is great? Some are kind of mechanistic, or but w they didn't do anything that made things worse and somebody on the team made it better. Or can we get feedback that actually this left you feeling worse going through it than you came in, uh, which is instructive for us to try to correct that somehow. So I think that's sort of a simple report card way 
builds on Harris and Fallot's work. Just to ask that question, interaction by interaction or uh, step by step. I just wanted to say we get ongoing feedback because of the relationships that we have built up within our um, core team and because we there's so much communication from the family nurse practitioners to all the other providers we get constant feedback from our patients but then we also get keep feedback from the community because with our community advisory board they're part of this as well and they've been educated about ACEs they've been educated about sanctuary and they actually want more they want to learn more because they were not aware so we're really just in the first steps of that process and what we would really like to do is to extend this out with um, among our four housing developers Developments that surround our health center. I'll just uh, weigh in too. Uh, we, it's a dynamic uh, process, and so we're constantly changing our curriculum based on feedback. So I was just at the prison with our ACEs uh, curriculum about a week ago, and uh, we're doing uh, a major uh, revamping or part two on it. And then the teams took the, uh, in the community that I'm based out of the region, took the amazing team brain booklet that you have in your bag as well, and they designed their own version. And so, and that's exactly what we want to see happen. You know, put it into your words and, you know, and t uh, teach us. We, um, uh, at the Bayview Child Health Center, uh, do it a little bit the old-fashioned way, which is that um, the Bayview Child Health Center is run by uh, California Pacific Medical Center, which is a Sutter Hospital, and we get press Ganey scores. So we do press Ganey evaluations. And um, uh, being the only um, uh, clinic wi within that, uh, within California Pacific Medical Center that does universal screening for ACEs, uh, it was interesting that we had the highest Prescani score of any outpatient clinic in, um, for CPMC uh, to the point where the, um, uh, the, the medical group asked our team uh, to come and train some of the other uh, ancillary staff, medical assistants, and front desk staff around, you know, what is it that you guys are doing to uh, get these, you know, amazing Prescani st scores. And I think we do the same things that we've heard reiterated uh, over and over again, which is um, we love our, pa our patients, right? <laughs> and so, um, uh, but ev even using the, like, the super traditional press gainy method, you know, it, it's not specifically around ACEs, but uh, we've gotten uh, really positive feedback. There's a question all the way in the back. Is that on? Thank you, that, that's great. And there will be a men's club meeting during lunch if you're <laughs> interested. Um, and actually, I think that Susan Dreyfus this afternoon will talk a little bit or a lot about um, moving our um, work into policy as well. So that's great. I see one more question over. Oh, two more questions. Um, yeah, that's fine. Again. This is a question for Linda. 
I wonder if you could talk about your, the decision to omit questions about exposure to domestic violence and child abuse in the booklet that you describe. We uh, went back and, and forth about this, and so, uh, but the, because of the issues that come up around uh, the sensitivity and we're encouraging the uh, uh, person using the, the booklet to talk to their health care provider about it. it. It was a lot of back and forth conversation, but we decided these are pretty obvious, serious stressors that there's more uh, community awareness about, so talk about it um, and indicate resources uh, for it, and then uh, segue into the other questions. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if that fully reflects all, all the discussion that went around it. Part, part of it uh, is the concerns around uh, mandated reporting, the, the concerns around domestic violence, and what we've seen happen in that arena sometimes <laughs> where uh, things being reported that aren't helpful uh, where the response isn't supportive to the client. It's kind of a long conversation, but uh, we felt that it, it's the thing that's ta talked about most, and so put it right out there, say here are the resources, and these are some other things which maybe you didn't realize how stressful they are for kids. Uh, uh, Christy, yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, talk into the mic pretty loudly. Okay. There we go. Um, so this is so wonderful to be here and also to, to be inspired by all of the groundwork that's going on. And my mind is going toward translation and policy and advocacy as well, which often is grounded first in health services research and measurement and all of those things. And I guess what I'm wondering is, are we ready for a special interest group here to really talk about what are the measures, the missing studies, and the health services research that's needed to start to really approach insurance companies and try to get those DSM codes in so that it can be named what it is and <laughs> not just PTSD or ADHD or what have you. So is it time to, to, to go or is there still more needing to open it? And if so, what are the missing measures and studies that might compel that? Like somebody asked about reduction of emergency room use. Well, we kind of presented a little bit of data earlier. There's might be something in there that we could really do if it were an intentional thing, but maybe we're not ready. And I just wanted to hear what you what your thoughts were. I think that's an excellent question. I think one of the things we've been doing um, and the Scattergood Foundation has been phenomenal with this is actually evaluating a lot of the health promotion programs we're doing, um, and some of that ties in with the ACEs. And we think it's most definitely time to start looking at the measurement and the economy um, that can shape policy. And we actually just hired a health services researcher that's going to be starting in October. So we can start to move this um, forward because we do think uh, policy changes are needed, and we think that's a critical component to look at some of these factors as well in moving um, policy and changing of codes and as you're talking about forward. We've had a recent experience on that with the uh, new state standards for graduation from high school. There's uh, this graduating class this year will have to pass a, pass a math exam, and it's either geometry or algebra. And we know and, and spoke with Dr. Anda and also um, Dr. Marty Teicher because we c about the legitimacy of using the disabling uh, conditions of ACEs for kids who don't have that abstract um, ability for that level of math and yet it's now mandatory for graduation. And we were quite concerned um, at the start of the school year because there were uh, 14,000 kids just in the state of Washington who would be forced to drop out of school over this policy non-awareness, apparently. Um, so we worked heavily with the legislature to try to get some attention and also with our state education system. And unfortunately, we really ran into, um, I don't really care what the science is, we're not going to give up our high stakes testing. And um, that was really discouraging because both Dr. Anda and Dr. Marty Teicher put their names <coughs> on this and the Education Committee said, um, we don't really care about the science, we care about state standards. So I think there's still a disconnect about moving towards this information. Um, the, the final bottom line was, well, the kids just aren't working hard enough. And if you know any of these kids, it's, not that they're not working hard enough. So we're a little concerned about the level of understanding that 
policymakers do have on this emerging science. And our, one, one last comment, when Dr. Medina came to Walla Walla, he said the education system nationally is 30 years behind what we know brain research tell us, tells us we should be doing. But it's hard to tell that to your legislature because then they think you're picking on them. I think Mark and then Nadine. It's probably great to have settings like this and uh, multiply that where we can cross fertilize and share what do we already know uh, that we just don't know from each other back and forth. Um, uh, the example would be within services to early childhood. There's a separate diagnostic system from DSM that in many states is reimbursable and includes a code for relationship disorders. Uh, which stress and trauma certainly could destabilize, but don't rise to the level of your usual uh, DSM code. I mean, so not to go into that now, but just to say that opens up a lot of reimbursement uh, and a lot of potential service if people know about it, know how to use it, or trained. Yeah, um, my experience is that. Um, we we have a little bit of a chicken egg phenomenon in terms of which needs to come first. Does the science need to advance further? Um, okay, so we want to the science advances further, but then we say, okay, well, you know, what are clinicians going to do about this? We're trying to get clinicians to do stuff, but clinicians won't do stuff because it's not reimbursed. And they say, how how do how do we do this? And we and we need universal recommendations. And then you know folks who are going to make, rec well, we can't make a recommendation for folks to do something that's not reimbursed. And so um, we have a little bit of needing to uh, build a plane while we're flying it, right, which is um, a, a, f a little bit of a frustrating uh, place to be. But at the same time, I think that we all, uh, one of the things my COO says all the time is like, play your position, right? Whatever it is that I can do, whatever, um, uh, talents that I can use, I can try to march that downfield, and then we have all the people in the in this room who are doing things that are complementary, and um, and uh, hopefully we can begin to full, fill in the whole spectrum. But I would say yes, it is time for us to be doing some um, number one massive public education campaign. It's um, uh, uh, Dr. Felitti uh, gave me a call, and he was just like, you know, it was it was interesting that the New Yorker article was able to move certain things forward that even with all the science and the data had been difficult to move forward. And so we also utilizing um, um, every single person, like the popular media, the press, uh, m public education campaign, because sometimes it won't be the physician who says, I need to screen you for this. Sometimes it will be the mom who will come in, or the dad, or the auntie, or the grandmother who will come in and say, you need to deal with my, with my kid because I think that they're suffering from toxic stress. Mm -hmm. And when that is, when the pressure's coming from all sides, from, from parents, from policymakers, from clinicians, from the, the media, then we will be able to get to the tipping point where there'll be an, enough of a coalition that we'll be able to move this work forward. So the, um, I know Betsy, Betsy and Megan are gonna tell me not to say this, but I think that the public education campaign um, slogan may be, that which does not kill you may eventually kill you. <laughs> and we can just use that for the public. Um, I don't know. It's 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 a double-edged thing. Um, I want to thank <laughs> David. Massages, or other question. <laughs> Well, Linda, I, can, you, can you repeat the question? Oh, uh, it was regarding uh, the, the work that we do around uh, talking about collaborative uh, leadership. And I, I think it's just, it is, it's a, a very different approach and look in terms that we're going to have uh, many leaders from many sectors working together. And that uh, one thing you learned about 
uh, running a dog team. I mean, I was a Kellogg leadership fellow, and I learned a lot of leadership theory, and I've learned a lot on the trail as well, is that you, your, your lead dog changes based on the trail conditions. So at one moment, it's going to need to be one of us out there who's really good on hard, fast trail, and when it comes, you got a big storm and you're breaking trail, it's going to be somebody else who's going to go forward. And it, it's being confident in what we do and empowering in our leadership for all the people that we're, we're working with and the Annettes and everyone else that they're right up there as well. I think it's in a short way the best uh, way I can uh, explain it. it. It's a very much, uh, I don't think the word empower can be uh, overused and the mentoring that goes on in this room is part of it too and uh, that, you know, saying you can't teach uh, an old dog uh, new tricks is totally, totally uh, untrue. I have discovered uh, old leaders in my kennel when I least expected it that were the ones that got me home and that's when I realized we just got to continually be creating those opportunities for those around us to, to come up front and lead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.